It's fall, and one of the world's great migrations is underway. From the Rockies to the Atlantic, hundreds of millions of monarch butterflies are heading for Mexico's transvolcanic mountains, where they will roost for the winter. But scientists are trying to solve the great mystery of the migration. If they've never made the trip before, how do they know how to get back? We do know that every spring, the monarchs leave Mexico, where they've been roosting for the winter. They head north through Texas. As they warm up and begin to feed, they become reproductive. They mate, they lay eggs, caterpillars hatch, they eat and become butterflies, which head further north. For those that go as far as Canada, the trip can take several generations. And then when it turns fall again, the generation then alive makes the 2,000-mile trip back to Mexico. So the question is, with no butterfly alive that's made the trip before, how do they find their way back to the same groves of trees that sheltered their grandparents or even their great-grandparents? How do the monarchs know what angle to go in a southerly direction in order to reach central Mexico? Scientists have taken monarchs from Kansas to Washington, D.C. If they let them go immediately, they fly due south, exactly they would have in Kansas. But of course, that would make them end up in Florida or in the Gulf of Mexico, where they die. But if they let them sit in mesh cages where they can see the sun go up and down for a few days, they readjust themselves and they take off to the southwest, just as monarchs that have been raised in Washington will do. How do they reset their internal compasses? Nobody knows. I recently went to Lawrence, Kansas, where Chip Taylor runs Monarch Watch, which operates a giant butterfly tagging program. We want to put it right there, and we want to do it for a couple of reasons. One is that this is the strongest part of the wing, structurally, all right? And two, it's close to the center of lift and center of gravity for the butterfly, so it doesn't impede the flight. He sends out 190,000 tags a year all over the country, and taggers will uh, catch butterflies uh, with butterfly nets, take them out, unfold them carefully, and then place the tag on the wing. Uh, the tag has a website number, a telephone number, and the words Monarch Watch, and then a sort of license plate number for the, uh, for, that each butterfly gets. And those numbers are all recorded. Butterflies are let go, and they go off to Mexico. Say goodbye. Goodbye. And then some months later, he goes down and pays Mexican farmers $5 a piece for every, every tag they bring back. The number of monarchs involved in the migration has declined sharply in the last 30 years, possibly due to global warming and surely due to loss of habitat. This is milkweed. This orange plant is milkweed, and it's the only plant that monarch caterpillars lay their eggs on. And the caterpillars pick up a poison from the plant, which goes into the butterfly, and that poison makes any bird that tastes the butterfly vomit. And that's why the monarchs have their protective coloration. The bright orange warns birds that they're disgusting to eat. The amount of milkweed in the United States is being drastically cut back because of mowing along highways and because of herbicides used on corn and soybean fields. Gardens like these in the Lenoir Nature Preserve in Yonkers, New York, are way stations for monarch butterflies migrating south. And scientists are encouraging people, even offering them uh, packets of plants, to plant gardens like this so that the monarchs will have some place to stop and, and nectar. But a much bigger threat is the loss of the fir forests down in Mexico. The trees are worth about $300 a piece on the market, and so gangs of illegal loggers are working the forests, and they've been chopped steadily back each year. Over the last 30 years, over half the forest in that section of the transvolcanic mountains has been cut. Its loss would mean the end of the migration. To the ecology of the world, that probably wouldn't make a lot of difference, but it would be a pity like losing the wildebeest migration across the Serengeti, or like the swallows never again returning to Capistrano. For the New York Times, this is Donald G. McNeil, Jr.